All right, uh, now we're going to take a look at this book, um, these writings. Uh, the book is called The Mound Builders, Their Works and Relics by Stephen D. Pete, Ph.D. It says, member of an antiquarian society, the American Antiquarian Society, American Oriental Society, fellow of American Association of Advanced Sciences, member of Victoria Institute, also of Société de Ethnographie, uh, co core member of Numismatic Society, of New York Historical Societies of Virginia, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Davenport Academy of Sciences, also editor of American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal. All right, so, uh, you know, this guy don't play. I, I guess, you know, you want to consider him a source or not. He, he is considered a primary source, you know, and, uh, you know, he's probably white, uh, most likely, but that doesn't matter. We're going to pull out the babies out of here, right? What did he have to say about the mound builders, right? This was written in Chicago, uh, again, in the office of the American Antiquarian in 1892. All right, so it goes right into the uh, introduction. Let's go to this part right here. It says, during this time, there have been many discoveries. The time of 400 years anniversary. Uh, consequently, made change of thought. May, many changes of thought. These discoveries and changes have had regard first to the mound builders problem. All right. Let me just zoom in. Some 40 years ago, it was held that the Mississippi Valley must have been settled by a civilized people who had migrated from some historic country. All right. So it was settled by civilized people, right? Not savage, civilized people, all right? This was held for some 40 years, all right? Who had migrated from some historic country. Hmm. Silver swords, scabbards, iron knives, Hebrew inscriptions, all right? Hebrew inscriptions, triune vases, and other curious relics were dwelt upon as proven this. All right, so Hebrew inscriptions, right? Hmm. All right, let's just belly flop to another part. All right, now it says here, right? Uh, this is uh, chapter one, right? I just wanted to point this out right away. What they're letting you know. Remember his credentials, right? It says the Mound Builders, chapter one, right? The Mysterious Races. The Mysterious, your Mysterious. My story. My story, not his story, right? Now you're Mysterious because it's your story. America is called the new world and so it is for it is newly discovered hmm. our claim however is that america is also an old world all right it's also not an old world it is the true old world it is the old world not also an old world dodge the hijack ain't nothing over there on that other side old <laughs> it's recent and compares well with other countries in this respect all right, letting you know right away in chapter one, right? The mound builders, right? The guy you saw his credentials, all the societies he's a part of. He's letting you know straight up that, yo, don't get it confused. Don't get it confused. America is also an old world and it compares well with other countries. He's talking about Egypt, Babylon, Iraq, all those places. All those places. China, India, or Hindustan, right? As it was called. It compares very well. We invite our readers into the field of American antiquities and will call attention to the prehistoric tokens and remains, which are so numerous, so numerous, so many prehistoric tokens here and remains. We are all well assured that there are many things which will interest them and that much may be learned from the study of American archaeology. All right, continuing. Now, look what he says here. This is almost, I just skipped this uh, paragraph, it's not in there. So it says, to illustrate, listen to this. Egypt has a history which extends far back into the remote past. But what occurred before history is unknown. They don't know how it started. It's what I've always been trying to tell you, right? They don't tell you how it started. All right, it's unknown. All right. The same may be said of Chaldea, unknown. Babylon, unknown. Assyria, unknown. We know who Assur is, right? Who the son of Assur is and india right unknown right the history of these countries is carried back constantly by a new discovery so they're always rewriting their history right because they didn't never knew fully making up things here nevertheless deeper obscurity has come upon prehistoric times it was the ambition of these eastern races to be considered very ancient but the fabulous dates have been disproved 
all right they give themselves all these crazy dates but that's been disproved it was debunked you don't go far that far back and that's what we're doing today all right those pe- those places over there are recent we talk what we talking about 1700s 1800s we're talking about the building of the pyramids dig on that all right these fabulous days have been disproved and yet the mystery still remains china is supposed to have had a history which reached back hundreds of thousands of years such extreme antiquity is denied to china sorry but her earliest history is acknowledged to be uncertain and obscure greece has had a more modern beginning but even in greece history was preceded by mythology and that mythology is dim and shadowy because who who are they talking about when they're talking their mythology in greece we've gone over this a lot right when we're talking about atlantis when we're talking about the amazonians when we're talking about atlas and Atlant, you know all these gods poseidon we're talking about over here in america right so their prehistory is what he's saying is all mythology it's they can't prove it you understand there is no beginning for the greeks because they carried that from here and that mythology is dim and shadowy the early history of rome is perhaps better known but a mysterious people is supposed to have occupied italy before the latins migrated from the east okay in scandinavia we find the story of the sea kings these figures conspicuously as the earliest heroes but other people dwelled there long before the sea kings in great britain there was also mysterious races we go back of the norman conquest to find the celts and saxons and go back to the celts and saxons to find the britons and the backs who were comparatively modern we read the story of king arthur and his round table and the tales of druids as marking the earliest period of history but we find the prehistoric people of great britain preceding all the same may be said of the continent of Europe. We go back to the days of messengers and to the earliest traditionary periods. But long before these, there were races in Europe. In America, also, there were mysterious races. All right, there you go again, mysterious. You're mysterious. Here, the one great event of history was the landing of Columbus. So he's saying that was the greatest event of history, right? To so their history, right? Who's telling the story? his story right his story his story that was their greatest achievement to be able to come here and conquer your ancestors and take all the riches and and then come to the terrestrial paradise and set up shop right that was their greatest event in history it is however a very modern event that's but that just happened the prehistoric period in america was much more ancient and prolonged than the historic and yet there is great obscurity over the entire period we have said before as the subject of this chapter the mysterious races especially those found in america we are to take the monuments and the relics as an evidence that such races have existed all right the evidence is coming out of the mounds he's saying we're going to show you we can't uh, put certain things aside with what they're finding right what he's finding he already knows again he told you in the beginning this is also an old world this is the true old world all right but we are to study these as our special source of information we call them the prehistoric races all right antediluvians and yet may treat them as though they were historic all right he's saying even though they're prehistoric races they are historic they were real they exist all right this ain't no myth like in the other places it's all a myth right egypt then you got who's the creators Thoth, osiris all gods it's all mythology greeks too it's all myths and stuff for them right here he's saying you can find the prehistoric races but actually treat them as historic all right we are to begin with the paleolithic age it is now acknowledged that there was a paleolithic age in america as well as in Europe, all right? There was Paleolithic people over here. That means old, paleo, old, old, very old, all right? All right, so real quick, I'm in online etymology dictionary, just in case, you know, paleo, what does paleo mean again? So there was paleo Indians or pa- paleo people, right, in America, just like in Europe, you're saying. So what does it mean? All right, all right, so it says meaning ancient, very ancient, early, prehistoric primitive people prehistoric ancient early people fossils from latinized form of greek palaios meaning old 
ancient from Palai, long ago, far back. All right, there was people here from long ago, from far back. Paleo, from very far back, all right? From very, very far back, long ago. We ain't talking about just 10,000 years ago. We're talking about really far back, all right? From Pierre Root, far in space of time, very far, far, man, not near, far, all right? All right, continuing now, he's talking about the Mississippi Valley and, and you know, why they would probably, you know, he was just talking about, you know, how, how it's built there, the geography and everything, the land, how many products and animals in, in different places and terrain. He's saying right here, a river system, which for thousands of miles drained the interior, furnished the channels for communication and was evidently well understood by this people a vast sedimentary basin through which the rivers have worn deep channels leaving tablelands cut by thousands of ravines and presenting bluffs headlands high hills narrow isthmuses detached island-like cliffs in some cases precipitous and difficult of access furnished by many places on which these people could build their defenses covering them with complicated works resembling the citadels of the old world of the old world beneath which they could place their villages and dwell in safety all right so look at that geography you got that geography over there in egypt today saw that geography i mean wow man right they resemble the citadels of the old world all right they build defenses they use these ridges and they build their own right it says the number of these ancient villages is well calculated to excite surprise Ten thousand burial mounds or tombs were found in the single state of Ohio, just in Ohio. All right, why are we talking about mounds? Just in Ohio, just in Ohio. I'm telling you, there's a lot of origin stories coming out of Ohio. A lot of tribes originated there or came out of there. All right, we're gonna dig into that. All right, so ten thousand burial mounds or tombs were found in Ohio, and also a thousand of or 1500 enclosures in the same state nor is their magnitude less a matter of surprise than their number by their magnitude it's not even just that there's a lot of them is their magnitude too how they were built 20 miles of embankment constitute one series of works 20 miles of embankment 20 miles can you can you even picture that can you picture building a mound like a wall like for 20 miles long that's a lot of work all right while sometimes 30 feet in height while sometimes 30 feet in height and then closing from 50 to 400 acres surrounding their fortifications all right man huge walls right they used to build who's 30 feet high in the in the man 20 mile <laughs> embankments and 30 feet walls all right these are not savages enclosing from 50 to 400 acres surrounding their fortifications pyramids pyramids 100 feet in height pyramids 100 feet in height covering 16 acres of ground 16 acres of pyramids all right 16 acres of pyramids all right we're reading a primary source here all right divided into white terraces 300 feet long and 50 feet wide varying with the pyramids of buying with the pyramids of egypt all right buying all right so he said buying with the pyramids of egypt so what does buying mean we're in the uh, cambridge dictionary and it says it's the present particle of vi v-i-e so let's go to that all right so it says buy all right to compete with other people to achieve or get something to achieve you compete they compete with the pyramids of egypt all right they compete with the pyramids of egypt all right vying with the pyramids of egypt form the foundations for their great houses all right mounds form their lookout stations 60 and 90 feet in height the variety of their works was great and their distribution widespread in one part of this wide domain there were game drives in which the animals hunted were erected in effigy in another part were garden beds covering hundreds of acres garden beds covering hundreds of acres and presenting many curious patterns in another large groups and lines of burial mounds 
in another many circles and fort rings, in another lodge circles and hut rings, in another village circles and dance rings, interspersed with temple platforms. You hear all this? You hear all this building and engineering. All right, how there was layout, these layouts, how they had the, these whole towns and cities, these metropolises. All right, in this area, the Mississippi Valley, and the, all around these mountains. So it's not just that you find one little mountain here. It's like a whole complex, you know, um, town, city, you know, like how they were building everything. In another extensive en enclosures with domiciliary platforms and another group of pyramids, groups of pyramids, and another groups of pyramids interspersed with fish ponds surrounded by earth walls, fish ponds that were growing fish around their pyramids. You hear this? Surrounded by earth walls. Everywhere was manifest a wonderful adaptation of the works to the soil and scenery and physical surroundings. Can you imagine just seeing that? Man, sometimes I wish I can was able to see that, like experience that, like just see that. Wow, man, just live in those times and just see that. All right? That sounds like people living in a golden age, right? So they were able to like use the nature around them, the geology around them and everything. Physical surroundings. Different grades of advancement were exhibited. But at the same time, great activity and great skill in gaining subs subsistence. All right. Every spot was well chosen and the works placed upon it were best adapted to the locality. All right. Science, high science, high civilization, high science, high science. All right. All right, I just want to uh, show this right here. It says uh, figure 17 elephant pipe found in a cornfield. All right, so uh, why would they be, you know, creating elephants, right? Obviously, they saw elephants, right? They didn't just find bones. All right, so I wanted to bring this part because they're talking about, you know, the um, they have a mound, an elephant mound. Let me show you that. So they have a couple of elephant mounds or effigies. All right, like this one. All right. So let's just read a little bit of what they're saying about one example of what they found to prove. All right. All right. So down here it says, Dr. John uh, Collett. All right. Let me just uh, zoom in. Dr. John Collett says that in the summer of 1880, an almost complete skeleton of a mastodon was found in Iroquois Co County, Illinois, which goes far to settle definitely that it was a recent animal and fed upon the vegetation which prevails today. The tusks were nine feet long, 22 inches in circumference, and weighed 175 pounds. The lower jaw was nearly 15 feet long. What? The teeth weighed four or five pounds. Each of the leg bones measured five feet and a half, indicating that the animal was 11 feet high. All right. On inspecting the remains closely, a mass of fibrous matter was found filling the place of the animal's stomach, which proved to be a crushed mass of herbs and grasses similar to those which still grow in the vicinity. A skeleton was found by excavating the canal embedded in the peat in near Covington Fountain County, Indiana. When the larger bones were split open, the marrow was utilized by the bog cutters to grease their boots. All right? Chunks of sperm-like substance occupied the place of the kidney fat of the monster. These discoveries convince us that the mastodon survived the glacial period and may have been contemporaneous with the mound builders. All right? You saw my ancient animal bi video. All right, elephants or the ancestors of the all common elephants actually um, originated here in America. And we had so many numerous elephants here. It was more than in that side of the world. We had different types of elephants here. Not how they just show us like these woolly hair. No, they had elephants that look like the ones in Africa. All right, maybe larger ears, maybe some t larger tusks or smaller ears, but they, they, we had different kinds here. All right. And, you know, these were here probably more recent than they tell us. All right. All right, this part of the book, uh, they talk about the discovery or they made uh, in the city of Davenport. All right, so this is the information they had. They say they found several uh, large number of relics, uh, seashells, copper axes, pipes, hemisphere, hemispheres of copper, arrowheads, pieces of galena, pieces of pottery, pieces of mica, stone knives, copper implements shaped like a spool, rondelles shown that treponine had been practiced. Many of the axes had been wrapped with coarse cloth, which had been preserved by the copper. 
all right the pies are all all of mound builders patterns some of them were carved with effigies of birds and animals one bird has eyes of copper another has eyes of pearl showing much delicacy of manipulation and skill in carving all right this is an art all right these relics excited much interest and were put on exhibition before the american association for the advancement of science at detroit 1875 all right they're uh, going around showing your ancestors art artwork right about uh 20 copper pipes were reported at that time and 11 copper alls and large number of bones they were said to have been found at various depths some of them near skeletons some near altars some in ashes though they were all from the same group of the cook farm the mounds on the cook farm were the most of them stratified all of them contained bodies and ashes two or three of them contain altars or round heaps of stone but with no relics upon the altars mound number three was the one in which the tablets were discovered all right tablets writing this was a low mound about three feet high and 60 feet in diameter it was a double mound and contained two graves parallel to each other three or four feet apart six feet wide and nine or ten feet long in making the excavation of the first grave the party found near the surface two human skeletons which were modern in indians and with them modern relics such as fire steel a common clay pipe a number of glass beads a silver earring Below these was a layer of river shells and a large quantity of ashes, which extended two feet below the surface, but which rested upon a stratum of earth, 12 inches in depth, under which was a second bed of shells. All right, so here's a figure. It's going to talk about this later on. This is um, the hieroglyphics of one of the tablets. All right. See that? A lot of this like this one looks like Paleo Hebrew, what you call Phoenician. This one too. Well, actually, all these right here, some of these, some of this one right here. Continuing, it says the second grave was not opened until the year 1877, about two years after the first. Mr. Gass was attended by a party of seven men, two of whom were students. They found near the surface modern relics, a few glass beads and fragments of a brass ring, also a layer of shells 12 or 15 inches thick. Beneath this second layer, five or six inches thick. Beneath the second layer, a stratum of loose black soil or vegetable mold you see that just sounds like what they did in the amazon all right talking about black soil kemet black rich soil kemet that's what it means black soil where's the real egypt all right or tamari all right loose black soil vegetable mound 18 or 20 inches thick and in the mold fragments of human bones at the bottom they discovered two inscribed tablets all right lying close together on the hard clay five and one half feet below the surface of the mound both were encircled by a single row of limestones about two and one half feet east were a copper axe a few copper beads fragments of pottery a piece of mica and a number of bones these were found at a subsequent exploration not at the same time as the tablets it says the large tablet is 12 inches long from 8 to 10 inch wide and was made of dark coal slate all right that's going to be figure 22 all right this is figure 21 so it says talking about the smaller tablet all right it says then uh it says it has three concentric circles though the signs do not the least resemble the mexican or the mayan calendars the larger tablet containing picture of either side one represented a cremation scene another a hunting scene a hunting scene the cremation scene suggests human sacrifice suggests he's saying a number of bodies are represented as lying upon the back and the fire is burning upon the summit of the mound while the so-called mound builders are gathered in a ring around the mound all right so again, it's figure 21, they didn't really explain that. Above the cremation scene is an arch formed by three crescent lines representing the horizon. And in the crescent and above it are hieroglyphic, some of which resemble the common figures and numbers and the various letters of the alphabet. There are 98 figures, 24 in one, 20 in the other, and 54 above the lines. The peculiar features of this picture are these. A root class of mound builders are practicing human sacrifice. Mm. Hmm. one containing a face the other circles and rays above this is the arch of the heavens with roman numerals and arabic figures all right roman numerals all right what did they find in the burroughs cave and in arizona right where's the real romans <laughs> and arabic figures all right we're talking about all these all these languages and glyphs they're finding in this part of the world all right the true old world remember he said this is the old world also all right scattered through and above it now you want to say oh kurimel said arabic he found arabic all right 
let's see what else he found. The figures eight is repeated three times, the letter O repeated seven times. With these familiar characters are others which resemble letters of the ancient alphabets, either Phoenician or Hebrew. Oh, oh, but don't say that one. Don't say that one. Oh, email. Hebrew, that's just a religion. No, see, you don't see. Where's the origin of all these languages? They're talking about Roman numerals, talking about numbers we know. They find it is in the mounds. All right, what's the origin of all this stuff? Was Latin, was Latin really originate? Those Latin letters and all that, right? Those Greek letters. Where do you think all that originated? We already know the Greeks took a lot of the Mayas uh, glyphs and made their their letters, right? All right, they're letting you know they found all this Roman numerals, Arabic figures, and ancient alphabets like Phoenician or Hebrew. All right, so I wanted to show you this image right here. This is the Davenport tablet. Let me just zoom into it. All right, maybe zoom out a little bit. All right, so do you see this? So they don't talk about this in this chapter. They're just showing you what one of the tablets they found in there, there in Davenport. All right, Let's see how they're like, he's saying they're like doing a ritual right here to see the sun, the moon, or what's going on here, luminaries. Is this the firmament? What is this? Is this what is this, the firmament? But you see the glyphs. I see, I see Paleo Hebrew. I see a lot of things here. All right, and we saw the Maya writing the other day. All right, with uh, the Egyptian compared, I see that here too. All right, so they don't talk about this tablet at all in this chapter, and the cha and basically, but I wanted to show you. All right, they already told you they found Arabic. Uh, Roman numerals, Phoenician and Hebrew, right? All in one. This is in the mounds over there in Davenport. All right, so dodge the hijack. Let me just zoom in a little bit more so you can see that. All right, y'all see some of you, a lot of you are going to recognize these symbols, a lot of you. All right. What is this? Is that the moon and the sun? Is this the firmament? What is this? <laughs> All right, I just want to show an example of some of these uh, ancient uh, mound works, you know, ancient works, how they had their towns and cities barricaded or fortified, you know, with these mounds. All right, it's just one example. You can find these today. A lot of them got removed, but some of them, if you use Google Maps, they're still there. All right, this is in Ohio. All right, I just want to show like this diagram right here. These are all mounds, you know, how they're built. Right next to each other, look at this. All right, 190 degree. Look at all the math and science. You see this? So they were building them according to the terrain and stuff and what they needed them for. All right, just wanted to show you this. There's so much info in this, I mean, book. It says effigies and burial mounds near Beloit. All right, look at this. Lake Koshkonok. All right, these are some more images. All right, they're sideways, but yeah. This one right here, let me see if I can zoom in. This is uh, popular, because they're saying this is like a, well, you know, dodge, dodge the hijack, but these are the, some say this would be like a Hebrew symbol. It's like the lamp. And then you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you got, you know. All right, so that is gone. That is not there anymore. I think, not all of it. All right. All right, this is the uh, one of the mounds in Marietta, Ohio. All right, there's a scribe in it right there. You see that? Just got more. All right, platform and circle. All right, square and circle. All right, look at this, the square and circle. All right, this is very ancient math. All right. This is in Portsmouth, Ohio. And you got this image right here, circle and square at Circleville. See that? They found things like this in the Amazon. It's what Graham Hancock was talking about. All right. And uh, you see this one right here. It says 50 acres, 30 acres. This is big. These are mounds right here, these walls. And this is the one actually that um, I think Glenn Beck was showing that you can measure the state here using the state, the measurement of the state, ancient Egyptian way of measuring. And it fits perfectly to the horizon and all that, and the, and the angles 45 degrees, 90 degrees, everything. All right, 
this, this is all sort of mound right here all this this line all this all right we're gonna get this uh, throwback from uh, my part five uh, video on this series same series that we're watching right now it's the untold ancient american truth uh this one's titled a hundred thousand years of forbidden history graham hancock there's a lot of drop in this video make sure to get that we're gonna get uh to this part of the uh video where we're talking about the mounds all right just corroborate most americans have no idea that ancient cities with advanced architectures once dotted the ancient north american landscape Director Kennedy has since coined a name for such places. What I call hidden cities. I use the term because these were very big places. There were more people, we now know, in Cahokia, across from St. Louis, than there were in London or Rome. Maybe not. Can you see this? Look at this. Uh, the entrance with the walls, right? The mound walls. There's the way in. Then you got the fortification mounds, and then you got two pyramids, mound pyramids. This whole thing is 50 acres, all right? You see this? They weren't playing, man. They were using the land and making their own fortifications and walls, all right? You got this other one right here. Look at this, let me back up, it's just big. All right, 20 acres here, 30 acres here, all right? Just, I mean, just measure all this, see? The little mounds here. They tell you which one covered way. Opening the wall. Watchtower. It says E. Right here, there's a watchtower. You see this? All this was connected. You see this whole complex? Wow. So it's village enclosures at Newark. All right, this is Newark, all right, where they found the Newark holy stones. All right. You see this? All right, this is uh, found here in the mounds as well in Ohio. Well, not in Ohio, but in one of the mounds. It says a portrait of Pipe Indian. This is a pipe. All right. Advanced ancient civilizations once inhabited the North American continent. And this fact was common knowledge just 200 years ago. As uh, Europeans moved northward from the Gulf in the 1530s and westward from Virginia after 167 and westward from Plymouth Rock in 1620 they did learn that the place had been occupied for a long time by other people George Washington saw major earthworks the biggest architecture George Washington ever saw was created by Native Americans along the Ohio River. They were viewed by the early settlers, of course. Uh, they were so plentiful that uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a surprise to have it on your property. Uh, these things were common. Uh, oftentimes, many of them were uh, reduced to, uh, to nothing because they were used for landfill in a, a growing uh, a village or a town or an upcoming city. Thomas Jefferson was well aware that there were very, very big earthworks in the Ohio Valley and he became aware thanks to Lewis and Clark that there were even bigger ones in the center of the continent around Cahokia and St. Louis. What were these ancient earthworks? Ancient city walls, buildings, roads, burial sites. Artifacts of, of iron were found, uh, artifacts of hardened copper, uh, stone tablets with writing. R regular farmers just plowing their fields would really turn up uh, literally bushel baskets of arrowheads, uh, spear points, etc. And uh, these things were commonplace. With the mounds that we see and the earthen banks and the ditches, to see them in such a great quantity and number, there had to be, just had to be, a very, very large population here at one time. None of that, virtually none of that, presents itself to us. Yes, in some small park-like enclaves, but 
Downtown St. Louis doesn't have a mound center. Downtown Cincinnati doesn't have a mound center. Downtown Pittsburgh doesn't have a mound center anymore. Marietta is to some extent Marietta, Ohio, defined by its ancient earthworks, but there's an awful lot that defines it subsequently. So the answer to that is we won't see it. Then we got it says a panther pipe from Carthage, Missouri. Panther. What do you mean a panther? Black panther, you mean? What do you what kind of panther? Panther means a big cat. This is a jaguar? What is this? In Missouri? Alright, a pipe. So you can smoke. Pipe. Look at this old picture or drawing. It says grave Greek mound. It's a grave Greek mound. Look at that. They built on top of it. <laughs> now, I thought this was interesting. This is one of the uh, examples of, you know, how they have their walls. They fortify. They make their own walls, and this is like the entrance to a mound city. All right, what they have? There's another fortification of walls. All right, but that's the main entrance. All right, you can see how they just made that. There's trees growing on that, so that's old, right? And then I wanted to show you this drawing. I thought it was really cool and interesting. Look at that. Big. It says Monk's Mound at Cahokia. The Monk's Mound. All right. This is huge. They got a house all the way in the top. He built this house right on top. He's like, you see me? I got my own mountain. I got my own mound. That's his property. Look at that. He built this house right on top of that. Wow. Some who authored the very first publications of the Smithsonian or the earliest books on North American antiquities described and illustrated things that would surprise most of us today. Some people, such as uh, Caleb Atwater and uh, Squire and Davis, they believe the artifacts that they were finding around these mounds and uh, cities and, and earthen structures, that this was representative of an advanced civilization. This is the very first publication of the Smithsonian Institution. This is the work that Squire and Davis were able to complete in the late 1830s to the early 1840s in what's called the Ohio Territory, which primarily worked in the state of Ohio, showing the monuments and the vast cities and the greatness that they must have had. Some of the sites that they surveyed and the maps that they made is our only knowledge that these sites even existed now because they were destroyed or uh, they were intruded upon and their original configurations were greatly altered. The real question is, why were these sites not preserved? And why are these advanced civilizations not more commonly known of today? All right, so, I um, mean, we got more. This is some more things they found in the mounds. Uh, I mean, I'm skipping a lot. I'm on pages 288, 668. So I just wanted to show you guys some things they found in these mounds in case you don't know, you know. All right, so we got all kinds of uh, artifacts, of course, arrow arrowheads and flints, a lot of pipes. We got a lot of pi European portrait pipes. It says European. How does that, how is that a European? And yeah, this looks a little weird, right? <laughs> so, yeah, there's a lot of pipes. Uh, found. Alright. Alright. More pipes here. Chevy Bird pipe. I'm gonna show you guys a little bit later how they found, like, not just any type of birds, but toucans and all this, uh, you know, toucans are from, like, warmer tropical places. So, how did, how did they know about toucans? Obviously, that shows you there was a connection of trade or even that they were the same people or just doing trade, right? Going back and forth. You know, there's no boundaries, all right? So yeah, these are more pipes. All kinds of different pipes, right? We got another one right here, trumpet-shaped pipe, it says here. It says trumpet-shaped pipe, look at this, all right? So, so many uh, of these things found in the mounds, of these artifacts, they're not showing all of them here, but look at that flat pipe, <laughs> all right? And then you got vases and pottery. 
and you see all these symbols on it i'm going to show you guys how we find the same things here in costa rica and mesoamerica same exact things with the same designs all right so there is a connection here all right you know look at this relics from the stone graves all right blooding ornament look at that blooding ornament uh, saddle shaped stone Indian maze all right another pipe it's a lot of pipes huh all right it says monitor pipe mound builder this is a mound builder who's that right there <laughs> who's that mound builder right there then you got this uh look at this see this is great the just tablet from ohio the just tablet look at that all right all right look at this all right it says rock in arizona with phallic and fire and serpent symbol phallic thought the phallic coat all right look at that then we got inscribed shells with fire fire generators or swastikas from tennessee you see the swastika you see that's an indigenous symbol not no nazi symbol they flipped it and used it but that was already here that symbol all right Cahokia tablet, look at this from Cahokia. Look at that, is that a bird or what is that? Then we got another one, Cahokia tablet, you see that? And a little braid coming down. All right, and I wanted to show you this one. This one's really interesting. So again, a lot of these symbols and stuff you start seeing in Mesoamerica. Now look at these two right here. Don't Doesn't this look like an Aztec or Maya uh, a symbol? Looks like they're killing somebody or sacrificing somebody, but you see how he's dressed and everything? All right, now again, this is inscribed shells from Tennessee, serpent and human effigies, all right? Tennessee, look what they got in Tennessee. All right, look at that. Doesn't that look like Aztec and stuff in Mayan? You see that? Did they ever show you anything like this coming from Tennessee? When you're in history class, US history, huh? All right, look at this one, all right? It has its own little design, unique design, but it looks very like a lot of Mesoamerican uh, drawings and stuff. It says engraved copper tablet from the Etowa, Etowa Mound, the Etowa, Etowa, Hawa, Hawa, Hawa Mound. All right, you see that? His long nose, big nose, what is that? All right, but I thought it was very interesting. It looks just like the Mesoamerican stuff. All right, just so many, uh, pipes they found there you know the relics they got there and look at this a chalice a pottery base this is a chalice <laughs> look at that all right more an eagle pipe all right and just all the little pottery and bases they got from ash pits it says all right so just wanted to show you all the stuff they've been finding here in the mounds all right again they show you this is a mound see the surrounding the wall that's the mound walls and more there's so many in this book it shows you all these different locations it has mounds and their layouts they're all over this is the tennessee river says here fortified villages of the mound builders all right they're fortified all right all right we're in part six of this series just to get a recap again correlate what we're learning uh actually uh you know right now so Thankfully, some artifacts in ancient cities yet remain, such as these once city walls intentionally preserved as mounds in a golf course in Newark, Ohio. I'm standing here at the parallel walls that connect the gigantic octagon with a large circle. The circle is 1,054 feet in diameter. The octagon encloses 50 acres, which is large enough to encompass four Roman Colosseums. This was built by the ancient Hopewell culture that lived in this region between about 100 BC and AD 400. The level of precision, uh, it, it is incredible. The entire Newark Earthworks encompasses four and a half square miles, and it was the largest complex of geometric earthworks ever built in the world. 
It includes two circles, a gigantic octagon, a square, and actually what we call the Hopewell culture, uh, things like it at least, and things related to it, uh, covered much of Eastern North America in different parts. As far south as Florida, as far east as, uh, as far west as Kansas City, as far east as perhaps New York. They had to be incredibly sophisticated um, to be able to build these mounds perfectly, you know, in unison to an octagon shape and a circular shape. It's clear that they rival by any scale, uh, any other cultural achievement in the world, the Great Pyramids, the Great Wall of China, um, the Roman Colosseum. I'm not that surprised by it. Um, there's so many other things that we see when we start learning about and looking into native culture that I think people on the surface may be surprised because they tend to think of Indian people as anti-intellectual or, you know, non-scientific or somehow you know, living in the backwoods and not knowledgeable about things like that. The knowledge embedded in these earthworks and encoded in their structure is anything but primitive. It's remarkable. You know, it also shows that not just high math, but uh, these sites are lined up primarily with uh, the, lunar, uh, the lunar calendar. They had high math, they understood geometry, and because of the lunar calendar, they also understood the heavens, astronomy. What I've learned now is just how amazing uh, they were in terms of their knowledge of the solar system and of mathematics. And then they had a unit of, of measurement was 606, which they call the stade. One side of the Great Pyramid from the base to the tip of the apex is 606 feet. If you square inside the octagon, which the uh, uh, surveyors like to call, it's a term they use, squaring, squaring the circle, and you divide that up into four equal parts inside of the cubes, you'll find those cubes are all made of 606 foot lines per cube side. The angle of the Great Pyramid of Egypt runs 51.8 degrees uh, up the slope from the base to the, to the angle. That, that measurement is there. And when you come off of the, uh, the baseline at the Newark and you run true north and then measure that angle back to the baseline, what do we find? 51.8 degrees. So, did they have the same math as the ancient Egyptians? Uh, well, I gotta say, yeah, it sure looks like it. Take the Mississippi Valley civilization, which plays a, an important role uh, in this book. The famous sites are sites like Cahokia, or Poverty Point, or um, the, 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 the Ohio sites such as High Bank and Newark. Uh, amazing, you know, huge geometrical earthworks, absolutely stunning. But the trouble is that in the 18th and 19th and 20th centuries, there was massive large-scale destruction of these ancient monuments. <coughs> they were not considered to be worth preserving. The needs of agriculture and industry were more important. So what we can say is that around about 90% of the monuments that were in the Mississippi Valley in, say, 1700 are gone now. Hmm. They're not there. So archaeologists, in drawing their conclusions about that culture, are drawing it on a tiny fraction that's randomly left by chance from the mass scale wipeout that was, that was caused. And then when the archeologists come to it with preconceived ideas about what sort of culture it should be, that's another form of censorship that imposes it, itself upon the past. We should let the past speak for itself. We call Atlantis the Antediluvian World by Ignatius Donnelly. This was uh, from New York, Harper and Brothers, Franklin Square in 1882. That Atlantis was the region where man first rose from a state of barbarism to civilization. And if you've seen my corn videos, if you haven't, I invite you to go watch them. You know, we see that agriculture helped the first civilizations begin. Agriculture, and it was corn. That's how we can trace corn way back 10,000 years. Also, point four, he says, that it became in the course of ages a populous and mighty nation from whose overflow in the shores of the Gulf of Mexico, the Mississippi River, the Amazon, the Pacific coast of South America, all the way to the Pacific coast of South America, and what's there? Peru, right? The Mediterranean, 
the west coast of Europe and Africa, the Baltic, the Black Sea, and the Caspian were populated by civilized nations. That the gods, the goddesses of the ancient Greeks, the Phoenicians, the Hindus, and the Scandinavians were simply the kings, queens, and heroes of Atlantis. All right, hijacked from the indigenous people of America. All these gods, right, they talk about where did they originate. And the acts attributed to them in mythology are confused recollection of real historical events. That the mythology of Egypt and Peru represent the original religion of Atlantis, which was sun worship, according to them, right? And there was sun worship by some of the tribes that were in America. Point A, that the oldest colony formed by the Atlanteans was probably in Egypt whose civilization was a reproduction of that of the Atlantic Island. So it says that from America, Atlantis, right? They went over to Egypt that we know today and colonized it there. And that's a colony of Atlantis, not the Egypt. All right, not the original Egypt. That the implements of the Bronze Age of Europe were derived from Atlantis. And if you know about the Michigan mines, you'll see that a lot of the Bronze Age metal that the Greeks and Romans used was coming from America, being mined up there. You can research that. All right? And it continues says the Atlanteans were also the first manufacturers of iron. Point 10, that the Phoenician alphabet, parent of all European alphabets, was derived from an Atlantis alphabet, which was also conveyed from Atlantis to the Mayas of Central America. Those parts of America over which it ruled were, as we will show thereafter, Central America, Peru, and the Valley of the Mississippi, occupied by the Mount Builders. All right. Moreover, he tells us that this vast power was gathered into one, that is to say, from Egypt to Peru, it was one consolidated empire. We will see hereafter that the legends of the Hindus, as the Diva Nahusha, distinctly referred to this vast empire, which covered the whole of the known world. As I go through the research, I find certain things ringing bells with me. I'm working in the Mississippi Valley. I'm at Moundville in Alabama, um, and uh, I'm looking at a notice board. It's just the beginning of my research into this, into this interesting culture in the Mississippi Valley. And the notice board has been put up by the, by the site, and they're, they're telling us about the site. And what they say is that the whole site was about afterlife beliefs, uh, and that it was believed that, the, that on death, the soul of the deceased would ascend to the constellation of Orion, and then would pass through the constellation of Orion to the Milky Way, and then would make a journey along the Milky Way where uh, it would face trials and tribulations and be judged on its behavior during life. The weird thing is, that's exactly the ancient Egyptian system of religion. It's exactly the system. It, it, it's too detailed to be a coincidence. What is that narrow star shaft in the Great Pyramid doing, if not pointing at the lowest of the three stars of Orion's belt, to send the soul of the deceased up to Orion, then indeed a journey along the Milky Way, trials and tribulations, and a judgment. The same story exactly. But how do we explain that? How, can it be a coincidence? No, I don't think so. Details are far too complicated. All right, so before we continue, I just wanted to remind everybody, well, this book I've read a lot, um, especially in my part four of, me, uh, of the Aboriginal American series that I have from Indigenous American to African American. And I uh, just wanted to bring this up again because I want to show you what you know these people know, what they teach each other when they get to certain degrees. You know, we know, all right, so it says ancient mystic oriental masonry. Its teachings, rules, and laws, and present usages which govern the order at the present day. It says true masonry in the universe of brotherhood of man are one. All right, so this is by Dr. R. Swinburne Clymer. All right. All right, so we go back to things that we have read before. And I just want to do a quick refresh of what we read before so we can get to the parts we haven't. All right, so again, they talk about Freemasonry because, you know, Augustus Le Plejean has a whole book breaking it down. I, and this book is telling you that we are not indebted to either ancient Egypt or either, or, or either religion or masonry, but to America, all right? Masonry, they said they thought they started in Egypt, Persia, Tartary, all that, India, 
but we are not indebted to either of those places in Egypt uh, for religion or masonry, but to America, all right? It is a fact that at Memphis, Egypt, in the pyramids under the guidance of the kings, the mystic rites of masonry were worked many thousands of years ago. But at that time, Egypt and the continent of America were one and the same. Egypt was in America. Tameri. Have you seen my video, Tameri? The real name of Egypt is Tameri. All right? All right. Egypt and America were one and the same. All right? It says, in America, rediscovered in the 15th century and repopulated in the 17th, was recovered Egypt. We, they recovered Egypt when they came here. You know, when the French were all over the Louisiana and Mississippi area before they sold it. That was Little Egypt. That's called Little Egypt today, right? Cairo, right? All the way the mounds are, all the way up to Wisconsin. That was Louis, um, the French had all that, right? So when they say they recovered Egypt, they literally recovered it. They sacked all the mounds, all that stuff, all the stuff they found, mummies, all that stuff. And they sent it to their museums and said they came from the other side of the world. But they had actually recovered Egypt here in America. All right. And what? The promised land, the promised land or the land of the constellation of the eagle, which um, Isaiah talks about in the Bible. All right. The promised land. This is a Masonic 14 degree book. They know who you are they know what this is this land here all right and we continue on the next page 26 and remember we talked about you know there was a cataclysm and the Mayans are talking about the lands that went under a little bit and you know in the caribbean and, and, and then we talked about a little bit of atlantis and then how the how plato and them and all these greeks were always talking about america now this book tells you the same thing it says and secondly with the consequent wrecking of the continent of america when the globe became involved in the consequences of disorder of the skies america America, all right, pay attention. America, known to the mystic as Atlantis. Who's the mystic? Plato and all these Greeks, mystics, these hermetic uh, <laughs> teachings and Hellenistic people. All right, what is America? Atlantis. When you talk about Atlantis, it is America. America is Atlantis. We are older. Atlantis, so called Atlantis. All right, when the ruin befell, was the seat of the greatest empire. The greatest empire was in America aka atlantis all right greatest empire that has ever existed and its irresistible armies were terrorizing all europe and asia we were going over there and kicking ass that's why augustus left john was saying all right we went over there we are the nagas all right the nagas are the americas all right the american plum serpent the serpent people all right if you study the american constellations of scorpio sagittarius and capricorn it reveals the immemorial antiquity of the name America, Amaraca. Remember, Amaraca, the kingdom of Amaraca was already here when the Spanish arrived. We had a kingdom in South America called Amaraca. All right. And it continues down here. It says, when following the course of the constellations, those immovable and perpetually fastened upon America reach, it will appear that while all this sublime in the historic past centers upon Egypt. All right, so anything we know historically, they try to say, you know, it's all Egypt or Babylon and Mesopotamia, all those areas, right? But all that is sublime in the prehistory, prehistoric past centers upon what? America, right? Atlantis, Atlantica, all right? Atlantis, all right? And as the current which has hitherto concealed the prehistoric connection between the peoples of ancient Egypt and of America, prehistoric connection, all right, is lifted until that is lifted. It will be seen that the people of the ego on the Nile being descended from the original people being descended, descended, who came first, America and the people in Egypt, what descend from the original people of the eagle on this continent, the twain are one and that prehistoric America was the original Egypt or eagle land prior to the mighty dispension in the days of Peleg, in the days of Peleg, when the earth was divided. The earth was divided. Is that a cataclysm? What is that? And the great globe itself was nearly rent asunder. All right, again, now we got this excerpt from Louis Agassiz, which we also got in a lot of different videos. He was the most renowned geologist. Uh, Louis Agassiz, if you don't know, um, if you take geology in college and everything, you become a geologist. Part of your curriculum is to read geological sketches, which was, which was written by Louis Agassiz. You have to. It's part of the curriculum. He was the most renowned and has been the most renowned geologist that ever existed. And what did he say? That firstborn among the continents is America. 
All right, we have the book, his book. All right, if you haven't seen my videos, go back so you can read it from the book itself. All right, from him. All right, so first born among the continents of America has been falsely denominated the new world. It's not the new world. It is the old world. It is the true old world or what they say in other books. It's also an old world, right? No, this is the old world. Hers was the first dry land lifted out of the waters, just like the Maya tell us. The Maya, remember the turtle coming out of the water? Mother, Maya, Ma, Maya, the water, the Ak, the turtle coming out, the first land. Just like it says in Genesis, lands coming out of waters. And then and then the Most High said, and let there be land, and it came out. And the Popo Vu said, let the waters and the land come out. Same thing. Popo Vu is Maya. All right, Maya. First land lifted out of the waters. All right. So while Europe was represented only by islands rising here and there above the sea, America slash Atlantis, Atlantis, we're talking about the same place, already stretched in an unbroken line of land from Nova Scotia to far west. Some have been actually bold enough to assert that America was not inundated at the deluge and that consequently the Aborigines were antediluvians. You are the antediluvian and the most ancient people on earth. You are the most ancient people on earth, which last assertion is correct. He's saying this is the correct one, that you are the antediluvians and ancient people of the earth. All right. Now listen to this. It says the people who erected the obelisk in Egypt and covered them with hieroglyphics, who wrapped mummies, embalming them with the greatest care knew no more about the pyramid builders than we do today he's letting you know that the even the egyptians today's egyptians the descendants supposedly the people living on they don't even know anything about the origin of their uh people because that's not them and the pyramid who built them all right they don't know anything they don't know even the ancient egyptians some of them that he's talking about they didn't know who built them all right, these majestic voiceless sentinels, the pyramids with heads uncovered and lifted heavenward, stood there on the broad plain, silent and dumb, with no one to explain their origin. Nobody knows their origin. Remember, it's a myth. All their origin stories is mythology. It's a legacy. There is no proof of how they got writing, uh, language, architecture, all the sciences they got, they attributed to their gods, Thoth and all these people. This is mythology, all right? Because these people were real and they lived in Atlantis. Thoth is an Atlantean, all right? He brought that from where? America, right? They already told us that Atlantis is America in this book, right? So it says they don't know their origin when Egyptian civilization or when it began, all right? Now listen to this. It says, of this, there can be no doubt the pyramids were built by Atlanteans long centuries before Egypt was a civilized country. Atlanteans. All right, remember Augustus Leplejon is letting us know that the Mayas are the Nagas, that the Mayas ended up in Egypt. All right, ended up in Egypt, brought civilization over there. Atlanteans. This is a totally different book, right? Saying the same exact thing. This is a book from the Freemasons, a very important book for them. All right, when you get this far, you end up knowing that Atlanteans or Americans, right? They already broke that down for us, right? They built the pyramids long before Egypt was a civilized country. We brought civilization over there. Why then were they built in Egypt instead of on some part of what is now America? Now he's dodged the hijack. How many pyramids do we have over here? Thousands and thousands of more than in Africa or Egypt because Egypt was then the center of the earth and the Atlanteans with their vast knowledge sought the center for that will stand as long as time, right? So. We had, so they're saying that was the center over there. Why is there no pyramids over here? That's false. We have all these pyramids over here, all right? This is his opinion right here. They know though, they keep telling you, right? Every, in every different way that we brought civilization over there, correlating with what Augustus Le Plajon is saying, all right? All right, so again, they're letting you know straight up, all right? This is there, it's no secret to them. They've been known, so they keep you away from this because they it's a convenience for them to have power that means knowledge knowledge is power right they have power over you because they have certain knowledge over you what does it say in isaiah yo right people went into bondage because of the lack of knowledge you our people went into bondage because of the lack of knowledge and we're still in bondage because of our, our lack of knowledge so again this was ancient mystic oriental masonry all right this was written in 1907 all right they've been known all right so let's go back so we've read in these last two books that you know we can see that america slash atlantis right 
had a colony established in the other side in Africa and in, uh, in Egypt modern day Egypt today and that's actually was built by Atlanteans or Americans right because when we're talking about prehistory we're talking about America right as the Masons teach each other so this book correlates with that I wanted to show you this book it's called uh, Civilization and the Ancient Egyptians by Katanga A. Bongo which I believe is an African but I could be mistaken so it says in this book the idea that it was Europeans who introduced civilization to Africa is one of the biggest historical myths. In fact, evidence from archaeology, oral history, traditional languages, and cultural practices strongly indicate that it was the South American Indians. Again, <laughs> the South American Indians who introduced civilization to Africa. Who introduced civilization to Africa? According to this researcher, South American Indians, some 7,000 years ago, long before the Greek and Roman civilizations emerged, the South American Indians had introduced civilization to Africa, thereby making Africa the second continent in the world to become civilized. Spurred on by their South American Indian guests, the Africans built great empires that lasted for several thousand years at a time. As you can see, this researcher is stating what we're cor correlating about the origins of civilization and where it began. I mean, I was surprised when you went to America with this book, because I thought, what's in America? You know, and because of all of the assumptions I had made and yeah. what I had been taught as a kid, it, you know, the simple, the narratives were simple. As little as I knew that there was nothing else there exactly. to talk this about. Exactly. This was the view, and this is why America is so is so interesting because what we have in the, the, the Americas, North and, North and South America, is a gigantic landmass, enormously rich in resources, just the kind of place where a civilization could emerge, just the kind of place where a civilization could emerge. So now we know that there were human beings there from 130,000 years ago. And we know that archaeologists haven't been looking at what they were doing. Now's the time to ask, what were they doing? What was, what was going on uh, in, in, in the Americas in, in that time? And again, a need for archaeologists to be more humble. How much have they really looked at? Advanced All right, so pictures. again, uh, you know, we're back in the book. Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finx by Augustus Lippler Jean, all right, the author of the Sacred Mysteries among the Mayas and the Quiches, all right, and also a sketch of the ancient inhabitants of Peru and their civilizations, etc., etc. He has a lot of books, all right, and I told you we're going to get through this book. It doesn't matter how long it takes us, you know, if you've been following me for a while, I mean, we've read so many books together, right? You're a scholar, you're a scholar now, you have all this information. All right, you have all these sources, you have all this background uh, history now uh, that you can use and that you can share with everybody else. All right, so, all right, all right. All right, so chapter one, uh, it says Queen Mu and the Egyptian Finks. Now it says here, an age is long lost in the abyss of time when Aryan colonists had not yet established their first settlements on the banks of the river Saraswati in the Punjab and the primitive Egyptian settlers in the valley of the Nile did not fancy. All right, so they're telling you before any Hindu people or any, you know, people in, in Hindustan or anybody in the valley of the Nile or right there or the other side of Egypt or any Egyptian, uh, wherever Egypt was, you know, they're saying that there was nobody there. There was not a fancy. Even their most hopeful daydreams that their descendants would become the great people whose civilization was to be the cradle of that of Europe there existed on the western continent a nation, the Maya, that had attained to a high degree of culture and arts and sciences, all right? So before they could even daydream, all right? Before them, before the Hindus, before the Egyptians, there existed on the western continent the Mayas, all right? It says here, Balmiki and his beautiful epic, the Ramayana, which is said to have served as a model to Homer's Iliad. All right, you see? So Homer's Iliad came from the Ramayana. Tells us that the Mayas were mighty navigators. All right, so the Ramayana 
all right this is a hindu book or epic or poem all right so we're in ancient history encyclopedia just real quick so we can get a reference right of what we're talking about so the ramayana do you see the word maya in it what is the ramayana it's an ancient indian epic composed sometime in the fifth century bc all right so they're saying it's supposedly more than two thousand years old all right about the exile and then return of rama prince of ayodhya it was composed in sankrist by the sage valmiki all right we just heard that name right so valmiki who taught it to rama's sons the twins lava and kush 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 like like kush son of him at about 24,000 verses it is rather long poem and by tradition it is known as the adi kavya adi meaning original and then first kadia or first poem all right so it's very old writing all right so we're also going to get into he's doing, he's going to reference the mahabharata the mahabharata all right what is this and this says that the Mahabharata is an ancient Indian epic where the main story revolves around two branches of the family, the Pandavas and the Kauravas, who in the Kuruksetra war battle for a throne of Hastinapura. All right, interwoven into it, this narrative of several smaller stories about people dead or living and ph philosophical discourses. Listen to this, it says Krishna, Dawi Payan, Dawi Dawit, Dawit Payan, Vyasa, all right, Krishna himself is the character in the epic, composed it as according to tradition. So they're giving Krishna, right, their god Krishna, I know you guys have heard of that, the credit for writing the Mahabharata, which we're going to see contain uh, stories about the Mayas and the, how they were the architects. They built their cities, these Hindu cities from long ago. All right, so Krishna is letting us know, all right. It says he did dictated the verses and Ganesha wrote them down. So down here it says, including with it within it the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata is one of the most important texts of ancient Indian indeed world literature. Very important. And it, guess what? It has the Maya all over it. So let's go back to uh, Queen Mu. I'm continue reading again. It said that Valmiki and his beautiful epic, the Ramayana which is said to have served as model for Homer's Iliad, tells us that the Mayas were mighty navigators. All right, you can go verify that. It's in there, and I did. Whose ships traveled from the western to the eastern ocean, from the southern to the northern seas, in ages so remote that the sun had not yet risen above the horizon. The sun was still not... What? <laughs> Oof. Wow. Long ago, all right? Remember long ago paleo long ago far far in the distant past far long long ago that being likewise great warriors they conquered the southern parts of hindustani all right that's what they call india today it was called hindustani all right the, that whole peninsula they conquered it right and established themselves there that being also learned architects all right since they were also learned architects toltecs maya all right they built great cities and palaces all right they're talking about what they did in hindustan these mayas became known in after times under the names of danavas you hear that danavas danavas all right we're gonna learn about that too all right and are regarded by modern historians as aborigines of the country or nagas what's up my naga as we shall see later on all right they're the aborigines of hindustan who the mayas who were known in hindustani as the nagas the serpent people the amaru amaru khan plum serpent the knowledge serpent means knowledge it doesn't always mean something bad all right so danavas all right just want to go to the footnotes all right because we got a footnote here they build great cities and palaces and then we got number two all right so let's go to the footnote real quick now it says 
Balmiki in the Ramajana, and this is in volume 2, page 26. If you want to verify it, go ahead. This is an ancient text, remember, 2,000 years old. Epic Indian, all right? In olden time, it says, there was a prince of the Danavas, a learned magician, magician meaning he can build, architect, endowed with great power. His name was Maya. All right, that's in the Ramayana. This is quoting it. We're quoting it right here. It was he who, by magic art, with his magic art, constructed this golden grotto. He was the Vika Karma, architect of the gods, this guy named Maya, of the principal Danavans. And this superb palace of solid gold is the work of his hands. All right. Again, go verify that. That's in the Ramayana volume 2. All right. Maya is mentioned in the Mahabharata as one of the six individuals. All right. The Mahabharata, we just got it. One of the most important of ancient Indian uh, uh, literature or even the world, it told us, right? Right in ancient history encyclopedia. All right. So Maya is mentioned there too as one of the six individuals who were allowed to escape with their life at the burning of the forest of Kandava, whose inhabitants were all destroyed. You hear that? something happened they got overtaken now we know we've read before how that even in the maya kingdoms they were warned against each other they were taken over some and they will you know uh, destroy the whole city or town take everybody take the wisest prisoners so this 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 is maybe another part of this like we're probably might be looking at the other side of the story right from the hindus perspective so they're saying that this dude maya and the mahabharata he was one of the ones that they were allowed to escape was he royal? He was allowed to be gone with their life at the burning of the forest of Kandava, whose inhabitants were all destroyed. All right. We read in John Campbell Omen's work, the great Indian epics. Now, Maya was the chief architect of the Danavas. All right. Chief architect. And in gratitude for his preservation, built a wonderful sabha or hall for the Pandavas, the most beautiful structure of its kind in the whole world, all right? That was built by Maya, that great Indian epics, all right? Check it out. Danava, it says too, now we're in the footnote number two. Now remember, look at this, Danava. Now look at this, it says, Tanha ba, tan mist, ha, water, ba, a composite particle used to form reflective dissonances. They who live in the midst of the water, navigators, Danava. Hmm. This Maya eti etimon accords perfectly with what Professor John Campbell Oman in his work, The Great Indian Epics, Mahabharata, page 133, says with regard to the dwelling place of the Danavas. All right, the dwelling place of the Danavas. Let's hear it. It says Arjuna carried war against a tribe of the Danavas. See, told you it was a war. Something happened. Arjuna came with his war and, and conquered the Danavas, the tribe of Danavas, against a tribe of the Danavas, tribe of Danavas. I right, pay attention now. Let's separate the D-A-N from the A-V-A-S. So it's to say tribe of Dan, the tribe of Dan, of us. Hmm. All right. The Nivata Kavachas, who were very powerful, numbering 30 millions whose principal city was Hiranyapura. They dwelled in the womb of the ocean. Woo! In the womb, the place of birth. They dwelled in Mesoamerica. They dwelled in the, the Mayak, the land of the first people. The womb, remember what it told us, like a womb, the woman, the mother. The Ma, Maya is the mother, the womb. First land out of the primordial waters, like Louis Agassiz told us. Just like matching with the Maya legends and their interpretation, right? All right, so numbering 30 million. So this tribe of Danavans, they were called the Nivata Kavacha Chas. Kas, right? They were very powerful. They had 30 millions. Who principal city was in Hiranyapura. They dwelled in the womb of the ocean. All right, the name Hiranyapura means Maya. Oh no, means in Maya, dragged in the middle of the water jar. Oh, you see that? So that's even a Mayan word. Hiranjapura, 
dragged in the middle of the water jaw. All right, so that was the foot nose. All right, now before we continue, I want to show you something. All right, so we're real quick right here. It says Danava, right? We just heard of the Maya, who was the Danavas. It says here that in Hindu mythology, the Danavas were a race descending from the Daksa. They were the sons of Danu, Danu, the sons of Dan, the tribe of Dan. They were the sons of Dan, Nu, the daughter of Daksa. Danu is connected with the waters of the heavens and is likely associated with the formless primordial waters that existed prior to the creation, the primordial waters. The name is connected with the Pyru Danu river or any flowing liquid. All right, the Danavas, all right. So, you know, this is uh, in Hindu mythology, right? What are we talking about here, right? So also just wanted to show you guys this. Uh, so it's like the word Maya, this one this is a good website i found so like it says here uh this is called uh, ancientvoice.wiki.com says danava maya and the mayans of america it says in this article now expanded into a series of articles i focus on danava maya who was mentioned extensively in ancient india literature in sankrist and tamil and explore the possible connection to or of Maya and his Mayan tribe with the Mayans of Mesoamerica. All right. So this guy's website is all about connecting that. He has a lot of good info in here. I've written about Maya in some other article dealing with other subjects. Maya belongs to the Asura Danava tribe mentioned with great detail in ancient Indian literature, including two of the four of the Vedas, the Rig Veda, the Atharveda. All right. So they also come out in these, the Vedas and the epics, the Mahagarata and Ramayana. All right and the Puranas, Mayas all over, in Sankris, as well as in Tamil epic literature, the Silakpati Karam. This is my attempt to bring everything about this Asura, the, the Nava Maya tribe that produced great architects, technologists, mathematicians, and astronomers of ancient India together into a single article. You hear that? The Maya. All right. Just want to show you like his topic here it says architect Maya and the concepts of Maya, Maya in the Vedas, Maya in Ramayana, Maya in Mahabharata, Maya in Vishnu Purana, and all this the Maya theory of the sun, Indian Mayans and the Mesoamerican Mayans, Maya Chola connection, Chola, Maya Chola, Raja Chola, Raja Chola, Prester John, you know that was another name for him, Raja Chola, Chola. It was like saying, yo, what up, Cholo? You know, that word goes way back, Cholula. All right. Other Indian tribes in Mesoamerica. All right. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, reading here. Queen Mo. All right. So let's go back to that again. Now we got a little more clear perspective. It was telling us that the Mayas, you know, are the aborigines of the country or the Nagas, the Nagas. As we shall see later on, all right? We're going to read this whole book. Of these, J. Talboys Wheeler in his History of India says, The traditions of the Nagas are obscure in the extreme. They point, however, to the existence of an ancient Naga empire in the Deccan, having its capital in the modern town of Nagpore. And it may be conjectured that prior to the Aryan invasion, the Naga Rajas and Raja Shola the Naga Raja Chola, right? Naga exercised an imperial power over the greatest part of the Punjab in Hindustan, all right? It was an imperial power. These were the royal people, these were the Aborigines, people who came from Mesoamerica, the motherland, Mu, Atlantis, whatever you want to call it, all right? The first land out of the primordial waters, Mayak says the Nagas or serpent worshippers dodged the hijack who lived in crowded cities and were famous for their beautiful women and exhaustless treasures their beautiful women were doubtless a civilized people living under an organized government no doubt that they were civilized all right they were civilized indeed if any inference can be drawn from the epic legends it would be that prior to the Aryan conquest the Naga Rajas were ruling powers who had cultivated the art of luxury to an extraordinary degree and yet succeeded in maintaining a protracted struggle against the Aryan invaders. 
oh, who's these Aryan guys messing with the Nagas? Like the English of today, the Mayas sent colonists all over the earth. All right, the Mayas colonized the earth. Okay, again, the Mayas colonized the earth, including Africa. These carried with them the language, traditions, the architecture, astronomy, cosmogony, and other sciences in a word, the civilization of their mother country brought civilization to the world science all right what you talking about net 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 <laughs> netter what you talking about that thought what you mean the office from atlantis oh you mean the hindus no what you mean the nagas the nagas are from atlantis too or oh, my yak all right the womb of the water the womb first land All right, it is this civilization that furnishes us with the means of ascertaining the role played by them in the universal history of the world. All right, it is to this people, the Mayas. All right, credit is due, with credit is due. It's not about, oh, the whole land was connected, but Kurimel, the whole land was connected. Africa's still old. No, no, you're not, you're not overstanding. You're not overstanding. You're, you're ignoring what I'm reading. All right, we're reading different books, different correlations. We're on part 12 of this series. Go all the way back to part one if you're just new to this. All right, credit is due with credit is due. There's an origin. There is still an origin to certain specific things. And you got to give the credit where it's due because if not, you're in the incorrect or you're in the wrong uh, orientation. You're seeing things in a whole different way. You're seeing it in reverse or backwards. You're in a spell. You got to break out of that. All right. Again, it is this civilization that furnishes us, us with the means of ascertaining the role played by them in the universal history of the world. The history of the world. We find vestiges of it and of their language in all historical nations of antiquity in Asia, Africa, and Europe. Speaking the mother tongue they brought from over here because the mother tongue is from over here. You got more languages in the Americas than in any other continent. Nowhere near the what Africa got. You don't know because you don't do the research. You think it's more numerous over there. You don't do the research. Future video. I got to do the research because nobody wants to. You want to come over here with your hijack. All right. With no sources. With your opinions. That's all good. You're entitled to that. But I'm going to ask you for sources and don't get upset. And I'm going to come at you, you know, because I know what I'm reading and I know what I'm talking about. And at least I'm showing signs so we can correlate. And you can def definitely disprove any of this if you like, you know, showing your sources so we can all verify. All right, because we find vestiges of the Mayas or these Amaru Khans, right? In their language and historical nations of antiquity. All right, in Asia, we're talking about Asia, the Middle East, that is Asia. Africa, you know it. Europe, yeah, all that, all those places. They're still frequent in the countries where they're flourished. It is easy to follow their tracks across the Pacific to India. Very easy. By the imprint of their hands dipped in a red liquid and pressed against the walls of temples and caves and other places looked upon as sacred. To implore the benison of the gods, also by their name, Maya, given to the banana tree, symbol of their country, the banana tree, all right? That's from here. They try to say that started over plantism from some. No, man, that all started here. Go watch part two. All right? When they came here, they landed here. It's like, wow, look at all these fruits growing there. This is paradise. All these food crops, right? We got... In Africa, right? There's 640 food crops, right? Uh, just about. And out of those 640 food crops, 600 are, are of American origin. These are facts. You don't know because you don't research. All right? Again, 
<laughs> they're known by name Maya given to the banana tree symbol of their country, man. Whose broad leaves is yet a token of hospitality. All right, a token of hospitality among the natives of the islands, then along the shores of the Indian Ocean and those of the Persian Gulf to the mouth of the Euphrates, up that river to Babylon, then renowned city of the sun, then across the Syrian desert to the valley of the Nile, where they finally settled and gave the name of their mother country to a district of Nubia, calling it Mayu or Mayo. Mayu or Mayo. All right. So, so. Hey Augustus, so you telling us there's a town or a city named Mayu or Mayu in Nubia? All right, an ancient city named that? Nah. All right, so just real quick, all right, going right back to the book. So we're in this book uh, right now. Let me just zoom in, just so we can uh, verify some of this information that Augustus is telling us. So it says here that this book is called A History of Egypt Under the Pharaohs, derived entirely from the monuments by Henry Brooks Bay, right? right from the monuments themselves, a history of Egypt from the monuments, all right? Translated from the German by the late Henry Dansby Seymour, all right? So this dude named Bay, all right? If you don't want to believe me, but hey, believe him, he's a Bay, right? All right, so volume one, all right? And we're gonna go to page uh, 363, and it's actually naming towns of Upper and Lower Egypt, all right, the land of Kita, the land of Assur, the land of Singara, and what they get from there, like silver gold from here. All right, real artistic roots. All right, so it keeps going and it starts naming a lot of lands down over here. It says, in order to give the opportunity to learn choirs to compare these names with those which have been transmitted to us from antiquity or which even now exist in modern times, we will give a complete copy of them on the authority of the inscriptions themselves. All right, so it says catalog of the following peoples of the South countries and of the An wandering peoples in Kont Hong Nofer, which, which, the, which the king has conquered, making a great slaughter of them. No man knows their number. So they got conquered. These people is about to name out. No man knows their number. All the inhabitants were carried away as living prisoners to thieves. You see all these inhabitants, they got carried away to thieves. Hmm, sounds like, what, so they were prisoners in Egypt, in bondage, right? These inhabitants, they're about to name out, all right? This is from the inscription in Egypt, all right? So these people, he's about to take out so many of them, they, you know, and he actually conquered and slaughtered a lot of them, right? And he brought them over as prisoners to Thebes, to Egypt, to fill the provision house of his father, the Teban Amon. Now are all people subject to the king. As was the will of his father Amon. All right. So it says the miserable Cush, Ater or Atel Adulis, Atel Mayo. There we go. M A I O Mayo. The Mayo. Atalmo in the inscription of Adulis. It says number four Mayo. Gold and incense land. The land where there's gold. Mayu. Gold and incense. All right. And it keeps going. Our tech now. Our keko near Masuna. All right, and it lists out all these people got conquered and sent over Maya, the Maya. They got enslaved and sent prisoners from Mayu, the people of Mayu. They got sent as prisoners to thieves. All right, they're under, they're still subject. And during this time that the inscription was written, they were subject to them at that time still. All right. So Mayu, this word, this reference is over there. In Egypt, and this is from their inscriptions. This is a whole totally different book. All right, so let's go back to Augustus uh, Le Plejon, uh, Queen Mu. All right, and we're back. So he said they finally settled. So he's talking about the Mayas, how they went from the, you know, from then Pacific down into India, all those countries over to the other side and into Egypt, uh, the Nile, right? And then where they set up. A district in Nubia calling it Mayu or Mayo. All right, after becoming firmly established in Egypt, they sent colonists to Syria. These reached as far north as Mount Taurus, founding on their way settlements along the coast of the Mediterranean in Sidon, Tyr, Tyr, the valley of the Orontes, and again on the banks of the Euphrates to the north of Babylon and Mesopotamia. All right, so. We got to look at this like, is he talking about the other side or is he talking about the real Mesopotamia, 
the real Euphrates, Babylon. All right, that could have been all around here, connected here, right? Or on the other side, either way, he's letting you know it's the Maya who brought civilization to these places. Now it says Mayak, that is the land that first arose from the bottom of the deep. All right, the womb we just heard in the Ramaya, that the Maya is from the womb, the womb, the land of the womb, the womb that came out first, right? In the Ramaya. So again, Mayak, we got that in the last video, right? The land that first arose from the bottom of the deep. We know that the Yaak is turtle, the water turtle, turtle that came out, the turtle, right? Turtle Island was the name of the empire whose sovereigns bore the title of Khan, Khan or serpent, not no serpent worshippers, not Naga serpent. We're talking about the, the title of the Khans, Khan, Delta, spelled today, Khan. K-H-A-N. What are you talking about when we're talking about draw cons and con? What up, con? All right. The con. All right. In uh, Asiatic countries, it's called con. They took the title. They took your title. They took your title and created their title. Genghis Khan? Nah. Nah, he wasn't the first. He just took a title. He just took over a whole throne, a whole empire that was yours. All right. We you talking about Georgie? We talking about Georgie Danilovich? Who we talking about when we talking about Genghis Khan? Georgie Danilovich, the original Russians? Future video. All right, it says this title given by the Mayas to their rulers was derived from the contour of the empire. That of a serpent with an inflated breast, the plum serpent, which in their books and their sculptures they represented sometimes with, with sometimes without wings. Sometimes with, sometimes without wings. All right. As the Egyptians did the Uraeus, symbol of their country. All right. Just like the Egyptians copied. <laughs> All right. A Aelian says it was the custom of the Egyptian kings to wear apps of different colors in their crowns. This reptile being emblematic of the invisible power of royalty. All right, letting you know how they had, you know, the royal, the pharaohs had the snake on their head, you know, they're, you know, that's royalty, that's the Khans, the Nagas, right? Serpent people, Naga. But he does not inform us why it was selected as such an emblem, all right? They don't know why though, when they tell you their history, nor does Plutarch, although he also tells us that it was the symbol of royalty, Pausanias, affirms that the A.S. was held sacred throughout Egypt, that at um, Omphis particularly enjoyed the greatest honor. Silarchus states the same thing. All right, he's quoting all of them, all right, so you can go look at the source, all right, what they're saying. Still, the Egyptian sages must have had very strong motives for thus honoring this serpent and causing it to play so conspicuous a part in the mysteries of their religion. Was it per chance in commemoration of the mother country huh could have been that of their ancestors beyond the sea toward the saddened sun could it have been that huh they're the ancient rulers after receiving the honors of apotheosis were always represented in the monuments as serpents covered with feathers what the heads adorned with horns we can we're talking about the dracons Fe a, a feathered serpent with horn, a dracon, and a flame, a flame, flame, fire instead of the crown, often also with simply a crown, a dracon. It is well to remember that in Egypt, the serastis, or honored snakes, were the only serpents with the asps that were held as sacred. All right? Don't forget what amaru means, amaru. Is the Andino or, or the dragon of the Andes, the Amaru, is basically the same thing as feathered serpent. Amaru Khan, Khan, get it? Amara Khan, Tamari, land of the beloved. Herodotus tells us that when they die, they are buried in the temple of Jupiter, to whom they are reputed sacred. Oh, big one right there. If you saw part three of this series, if you not, go watch it after this. We're talking about the Pyramid of Cholula, 
because we're talking about that Herodotus describes the pyramid of Jupiter Belus exactly the same way that the pyramid of Cholula looks. This is confirmed by many people and by Alexander the Humble. He says it's an exact copy of what Herodotus described as the Tower of Belus or Jupiter in Babylon. So what are we talking about when we're talking about buried in the temple of Jupiter? Are we talking about the pyramid of Cholula and the true old world whom they are reputed sacred? It says the Maya Empire comprised all the lands between the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and that of Darien. Darien is all the way down into Panama. So the whole, from the Yucatan down, all the way down to Panama. That was the whole Maya Empire. All right. But the capital, the capital was more like towards the Yucatan, Guatemala areas, those main cities. Today, known today as Central America, okay? Central America. The history of the sovereigns that had governed it and of the principal events that had taken place in the nation was written in well bound books, but by papyrus or parchments covered with highly ornamented wooden boards, while the most important occurrences were likewise carved in stone on the walls of their public edifices to preserve their record in a lasting and indelible manner for the knowledge of future generations, all right? The history is there, the sources are there, they got their history unlocked, their origin story, everything. That's what he's trying to let you know, that in these places like Greek, uh, Greek is all mythology. Their origin is all mythology. The gods is all mythology. There's no origin. There's no physical proof of their origin other than mythology, just like in Egypt. You understand where did the language come about? How did they start learning science and building pyramids? It's all mythology. It was given to them by the gods, right? These gods were living people living in that and 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 over here in Mayak, Atlantis, whatever you move, land of move, whatever you want to call it, over here. All right, and this is in the walls, this is in the scribes, this is still written in their stories. You just got to go research it, learn the language if you have to, all right? Because it's there for the knowledge of future generations. They're talking about us, all right? Especially the descendants, right? It is from these sculptured and written memoirs graving on their palaces at Usmal and Chichen in the peninsula of Yucatan, the head of the imperial serpent, and the seat of the government of the Maya Empire, all right? That the author has learned the history of Queen Mu and her family. That's where he learned about it, where? In Uxmal and Chichen. He learned about the story of Queen Mu and her family, all right? Letting you know. All right, so before we continue, just wanna come back to uh, this video that I made. Uh, this is part 10 of Untold Ancient American Truth, another, uh, you know, of this same series, part 10. The ancient Nagas are the Maya. All right, we just already read that, um, but this was another part. This was actually the pre or preface of that book. All right, so, you know, get that drop. Now, I want to go back to this because we're talking about, you know, we just, again, the Masons told us, you know, they already know this is ancient Egypt. This is, when you're dealing with prehistory, you're dealing with America, Atlantis, all right? So let's get this again, because it correlates what we're, what we're doing. We, we saw in the last video, you know, what they found there and then the hieroglyphics, how they were comparing it, right, with the Maya and the Egyptian and how, you know, what it means and, you know, the whole story behind Mayak, all right? So let's get this again, like it's the first time. So this is called Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids by Peter Tompkins, author of Secret of the Great Pyramid. All right, so I'm on page um, 116 of this book. I just wanted to zoom into this uh, table right here, this chart. I just wanted to show you real quick. All right, it says Maya and Egyptian. All right, they're comparing the hieroglyphics. All right, so you see that? Very similar, right? In some cases, this one, this one right here, right here. That. not too different all right so you understand who's the real nagas and you know we got it in the past videos who civilized who all right we're just going to get more correlation in this video all right says so a later comparison between mayan and egyptian alphabets so just want to read about uh this part of the book but first they're going to be t mentioning this uh archaeologist it says in the college of san gregorio mexico city brazil discovered a manuscript and a hual to which he gave the name of Chimalpopoca 
CODIS in honor of his teacher of Nahual Faustino C. Galicia, who was a descendant of Moctezuma's third son. All right, so this brochure is a French guy. Um, he actually translated the Popol Vuh also in French. It's very popular. So it's, it was a Spanish translation. We got this before in my last Hebrew video. All right, and um, we mentioned Brasur as well. So I just want to read here what Brasur says. It says, Brasur also traced the myth of Quetzalcoatl back to Plato's Atlantis. So Quetzalcoatl is from Atlantis. <laughs> and concluded that the Toltecs could have been descendants of survivors of that catastrophe. Gradually, Brazor ascribed an increase in antiquity to the native cultures of Mesoamerica and came to believe that many of the truths of modern science had already been anticipated by the inhabitants of Mesoamerica many centuries previously. He's saying that he had to increase how old they were, antiquity, the Mayas or the natives of Mesoamerica or the cultures, all right, the aboriginal cultures of Mesoamerica and that Many of the truths that we know today as modern science, as fact, right? This was already anticipated by our ancestors back in the day in Mesoamerica, many centuries previously, all right? Science, high advanced, you know, math, science, architecture was all here. As he grew older, his cultivated notions grew out of step with those of his academic contemporaries. His penchant for seeing in myths of antiquity explanations for what might have been actual history was too much for them. All right, so he was breaking down that these myths were actually real history, not just a myth. And, you know, he's saying the other historians couldn't, you know, couldn't handle that. They weren't ready for that. As one historian summed up the situation, unfortunately, as book after book appeared, his ideas grew more strange and his explanations more attenuated so that serious leaders who had respected him increasingly lost confidence in his utterances. So his books and his a lot of his works weren't mentioned. A lot of, they're not really mentioned in a lot of textbooks. You know, they do this on purpose. Brasur complained that no serious archeological work was being done in the Americas, that it was foolish to try to write world history, leaving out one half the world, all right? How could they try to write world history when they only write on about the other side of the world? When we got all these advanced civilizations over here on the other half of the world, right? So it was so foolish to try to write world history leaving out one half of the world, the Americas. He believed the Carrions of Central America to have been the oldest known civilization. The oldest, he's talking about in the world, not just in the Americas. And industrious and commercial people who could handle metal and precious stones, great sailors and astronomers who had traveled the world colonizing Atlantis. They colonized it. This is Atlantis, this is that center. This is the origin. And they also colonized what? The Mediterranean and ancient Egypt. Who civilized who? Whose astronomy, physics, and religious practices were similar, including a strong cult of Sirius the dog star and deification of the crocodile the crocodile from all which Brasur concluded that either Egypt had been a Central American colony or vice versa and you know the truth is that it was a, just a colony of Atlantis so-called Atlantis America or Central American colony all right the Maya All right, so we got that uh, that part of the my, my video, you know, talking about correlating. All right, again, what the Mason said, you know, Central America went and civilized the world. All right, like Gustav Leplejean is letting you know from his translations of what he found, it's saying the same thing. All right, you know, they're finding all these uh, uh, structures and everything in the jungle right now. All right, this is from National Geographic right here. It says Lost Treasures of the Maya Snake King. So go get that. We got some footage from that. All right, go look for that on Ge National Geographic. Um, you know, on in the internet, just put the Lost Treasures of the Maya Snake Kings. All right, if you want the documentary, hit me up. All right, and again, Snake Kings or Serpents or the Nagas, the Plum Serpent. And it said the Carrions, right? Kara, Kara. Kara is like saying black almost or dark skin, black. Kara, the Carrions or the 
the blacks, he's, he's trying to say the blacks, so-called blacks of Central America, all right, brought civilization to Egypt, all right? All right, so we're going to continue with this video uh, again, all right, it's just to correlate what we were just talking about, all right? So, again, part 10, Untold Ancient American Truth. Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids, again, by Peter Tompkins. I want to read this real quick, too. All right, this is on page 153. It says, the first real digs. All right, has these maps. You can see all this. I've shown this actual image before. All right. And I just want to read the side note right here real quick. Let me zoom in. All right, I'm zoomed in. Uh, it says, Charnay was surprised at the variety of human types portrayed on masks often with considerable artistic skill. There were the features of Caucasian, Greek, Chinese, Japanese, and Negro. All right, and Negro. This doesn't mean African. Also, Maya type heads with retreating foreheads, such as that had, had such as he had seen in Yucatan. They seem to validate the theories of Violet Leduc about an influx of Europeans and Asiatics, leading Charnay to comment that numerous races must have succeeded each other and amalgamated on the continent, which until lately was supposed to be so new and is in truth so old. This continent, America, is actually in truth so old, the true old world. Yes, this is the true old world. That's why you find all these phenotypes here. I've been trying to explain. We had all kinds of phenotypes. This is the origin. All right, this is Atlantis. All right. So it was supposed to be so new and is in truth so old. During 15 years of investigation of thousands of pre-Columbian terracotta pottery heads and figures, art historian Alexander von Butenau found portraits of five different racial types, Mongoloid, Chinese, Japanese, Negroid, and all types of white people, especially Semitic. So Semitic supposed to be white. That's the hijack, all right? Types with and without beards. So Shemitic or Shem, with beard and without beards, all right? All right, so I just want to continue. This is on page 350 in this book, uh, Mysteries of the Mexican Pyramids. It says right here, let me just zoom in real quick. Uh, let me just tablet right here you see this one right here it's on the wall somewhere it says Hugh Hugh Fox and his gods of the cataclysm says the association with the jogic trance is especially evident in these Monte album figures all right a jogic dance that's like a Hindu thing right but we see that there was actually here with the Maya in these Monte album figures because the design portrayed on the dancers bodies are chakras all right these are chakras you see the chakras all right we had that knowledge of that here the mystic centers connected with successful meditation all right let me just read this part right here it says like the olmecs the earliest known settlers of monte album had a hieroglyphic system of writing, a calendar, and a mat mathematical system of computing by bar and dot. These settlers left some extraordinary cyclopean rocks built into buildings which portray life-size negroid dancers with flat noses, round faces, and thick lips. Alongside them are Old Testament types. Old Testament types? Alongside them are Old Testament types. Old Testament types, you see that? With hooked noses and spatulate beards. All very un-Indian. They're talking about the modern day so-called Native Americans, right? They don't resemble them. Archaeologists date these finds around 500 BC and attribute their ruins to the Olmec, all right? Again, they just named that as a tag. They didn't call themselves Olmec or rubber people. That's what they named them, all right? It says startling Semitic figures found throughout Mesoamerica. You see this? All right, so we continue in the book, The Lost Continent of Mu by Colonel James Churchward, 1931. And I'm in page 113, wanted to read this part to you. More correlation to what we're, you know, learning. It says, now I shall try to fix an appropriate date of the Naga colony in India before it became a colonial empire, all right, so a colony. One prominent figure in the Naga or Maya Empire in India 
So this Naga Empire is really the Maya Empire in India. It's a colony of the Maya. So it says that one prominent figure of this Naga or Maya Empire in India was Prince Maya. Yes, Prince Maya. They had a prince. His name was Maya. The time of Prince Maya is doubtful. Although I have come across many records about him, not a single one even estimates the day when he lived. But according to traditions, and these traditions are as plentiful as leaves on a tree. Prince Maya lived 15,000 to 20,000 years ago in Ramayana or in the Ramayana. All right, that's a book, an ancient Hindu book of poems or stories or something like that. All right, we find this reference to him. In olden times, there was a prince of the Nagas whose name was Maya of the Serpent Kings of the Nagas. Who's the Serpent Kings again? The Mayas, right? His name was Maya. Prince Maya was the author of the Surya Siddhanta, the Horius Treatise on Astronomy in India. Its age has been variously estimated at from 10,000 to 22,000 years. At the time of Prince Maya, the Nagas were an empire. When the handle and shove of this knife were made, the Nagas were a colony antedating the empire. That they were only a colony is clearly shown by the suns without rays on the horizon. This proves the extreme antiquity of the handle and the sheep. All right. And this is what they're talking about, this knife and handle. The Naga Hindu knife, they call it. It is not known when the Naga Empire ended, but they're saying that this is very old, before their empire was established, when they were just colonists coming from America. All right, so I wanted to get into this book, uh, actually for a while now, but it's just hard to get into all the books that I have. But this one's called uh, Myth of Pre-Columbian America. And uh, we're going to get into this book later on in other videos when we're talking about the myth, mythology, and how to correlate that with, you know, the mythology of the old world. But this book does a pretty good job with that. And this is actually a scanned copy, it says here, of the Government of India, Department of Archaeology, Central Archaeological Library. All right, so they have a copy of this book. All right, we're going to get into. And just take a look at this image. All right. <laughs> this is right before the book starts. Copper colored. Who's that? Look at his swarthy, so-called black or brown complexion. All right. And that is, they say, Tlaloc, the rain god. This is from the Codex Vaticanus. All right. The facsimiles of, uh, you know, the codices that the Aztec or Mexica people left. All right. So this is, again, myths of pre-Columbian America. All right, by Donald A. McKenzie. All right, all right. So we're in the preface of this book, number eight. It says throughout this volume, many links are traced between the old and new worlds. Many links. All right, but none is more remarkable than that afforded by the American story of Japan. You see that Japan, just like Japan, Japan. This is from here, Japan. He talks about this in chapter 8. We'll get into that. Which so closely resembles in all its essential features a characteristic Hindu myth found in the Mahabharata. All right, so now we got another story that relates to another reference or name from the Americas that comes out in the Mahabharata. We got that the Ramaya or Maya, Prince Maya. All right, the architects, the Mayas, they went over there and built these cities. All right, in India, the Nagas, right? So now we got another story in the Mahabharata, which closely resembles something in America, the name Japan, all right? But right, that's to continue, you know, the book was mentioning uh, how the, the, the deity Yapa from Mexico, Yapa, Japan, uh, has a lot of, you know, similarities to the a story in the Mahabharata, all right? So we're going to get into who is Japan and what, how does it correlate to other deities. So we're in the Encyclopedia of Ancient Deities by Charles Russell Coulter and Patricia Turner. All right. And over here, we're just going to try to zoom in. Japan, it says it's from the Toltec people of Mexico, also known as Japan. Look at that. Japan with a J, just like the country. You see where they get the name? But this is from the Toltecs. All right. Japan, that's where you get because that's why you think the dragon's over there. You find uh, mounds and pyramids and buildings in Japan, just like over here in America. 
It says it's a deified mortal. Japan was an ascetic mortal who wanted to win the favor of the gods. So he was a human, right? He was a mortal. Wanted to win the favor of the gods, leaving the world behind. He moved to the top of a huge rock and lived as a hermit. The gods, suspicious of Japan, sent numerous women to seduce him. He did not bite the bait. All right? He did not bite the bait. All right? So that means he stayed celibate. All right? Let's go to another book right here. It says that it's uh, Mexico before and after the conquest by Michel Chevalier. All right. And then it's talking about over here. So we get that. So it's the tradition of Quetzalcoatl has many prototypes in the mythologies of the old world, but the Mexicans had legends which in other modes resemble the fabulous stories of Greece. All right, you hear that? The fabulous stories of Greece. Hmm. So where did the Greeks get their poems and stories from, huh? Really? As we read what has been preserved of them, we almost fancy translation of the metamorphosis of Ovid is before us. All right. If you don't know what that is, it's this. Uh, all right. So this Ovid is a supposed Greek, right? From, you know, the first. Well, this is supposed to be made in the a, the year eight. 8 AD, all right? Yeah. 8 AD. This is how old this is supposed to be. And this is, has some poems and stories, all right? That's what he made of it, all right? I guess there's a lot of different types. So the dude is uh, referencing that he has, like, a similar story that he read in the Ovid. He finds it in over here in Mexican, all right? In Legends, all right? And he's going to quote it. It says, a man named Japan. So this is from a story over here, all right? So a man named Japan, all right, wishing to win the favor of the gods, left his wife and family and withdrew into the desert to lead a life of chastity and contemplation. Chastity, all right, in contemplation and build a cabin near an altar of stone consecrated to penitence. But the gods who doubted the sincerity of his conversion charged Jaolt, his mortal enemy. Jaolt, Olt, Aolt. To watch him continually and keep an account of every action. Japan for a long time resisted many beautiful women sent to tempt him. All right, he resisted women. He stayed celibate. So that the gods began to praise his virtue and laugh at Tlaxolteol, the goddess of love. And say that Japan was not like other mortals, subject to her. I guess she was seducing all the mortals, right? No mortal could say no to her. This goddess. Right. Until picked by their ridicule, she said, Do you believe that Japan will preserve to the end to merit the recompense you grant to the virtuous? I will myself descend to the earth to show how fragile is human virtue and how little mankind are able to resist my power. The goddess approached the house of Japan, but perceiving him seated on the altar of penitence, knew that there she could exert no power over him. She said in a tender voice, Come hither to me, Japan. I am the goddess. Trasol Teolt. 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 Did you old? Teolt. Come to bring to thee the reward of thy virtue. Deceived by her words, Japan hastened to her. But scarcely had he left the altar when he felt a new fire circulate through his veins and he fell into the snare prepared for him. This right here, I just want to read a little bit right here. It says, In the popular faith of Mexico, many traits of common resemblance to all the religions of the old world will be found from which a harmony results which cannot be accounted for, or except by the supposition that all have a common cradle. All right, look, this is I'm just I was just reading the Japan drop. This is a whole different drop here. All right, now look at this. So he's going into it, right? What we're talking about. Where is the true old world? All right. How come there's so many resemblances? How, what, at what point do we say, all right, enough with the coincidence, right? And let's do some real research. All right. Where's the true old world? All right. Put all your emotional, personal attachments aside. All right. So we're at this other book. All right. Now we're going to talk about, well, all right. This is the Encyclopedia of World Religions by Encyclopedia Britannica. All right. And then we got Ayapan. All right, now look at this name. 
if you remove the A and the Y, the first two letters, you just have Japan, right? Just like we have right here, Japan, right? Y A P P A, Toltec, Toltec, Aztec, Toltec, all right? So we got Ayapan, all right? It says in Hinduism, he's a deity as well, all right? Who is always and at all times celibate, all right? So remember, Japan, he would get women to try to, you know, seduce him and he wouldn't he wouldn't bite right he wouldn't bite so just like japan he was celibate generally depicted in yogic posture wearing a bell around his neck his most prominent shrine in sabari malai in the southern indian state of kerala and he enjoys popular and he enjoys popularity mostly in kerala through the neighboring states of Tamil Nadu and Karnataka, also house many Ayapan all right, temples. Ayapan may bear a historical relationship to the tutelary deity Ayyanar or Tamil Nadu. The most public aspect of the worship of Ayapan is the annual pilgrimage to Sabari Malai, in which only men, pre adolescent girls, and post menopausal women are allowed to participate. Prior to the journey, pilgrims who annually number around 1 million are required to observe strict vows of celibacy and abstain from meeting intoxicants for a period of traditional 41 days. All right. So I upon, so I upon a lot of, uh, you know, worship around being celibate and, you know, the respect of that. Just like Japan remained celibate. All right. When they, he was getting tempted by these women the gods were sending. All right. So they're celebrating that. When the Historical Dictionary of Hinduism by Jeffrey D. Long. And it says, Ayapan Dairi be believed to reside at the top of Sabari Mala, a hill in Kerala and is sacred to his devotees. Uh, just like Japan went to, you know, he separated himself into isolation. Uh, it says, Ayapan is regarded as the son of Vishnu and Shiva from a time when Vishnu appeared to Shiva as a beautiful woman called Mohini. According to one version of the story of Ayapan, Vishnu took the form of Mohini so a deity could be born from the union of Vishnu and Siva that would have their combined power to be able to defeat the Asura, Princess Mahisi, the sister of Mahisa Asura, or Buffalo Demon, who was slain by the goddess Durga. All right, so you see that? So they don't let, right here it tells you that they don't let women in this temple now, in modern time, because they believe that their presence would be a temptation to the young male deity house there. So Ayapan, devotion to Ayapan. They don't allow women. All right. So they, where are they getting all this story from? Well, you see how they, all right. So Ayapan had to fight a demon. All right. So it says that, um, and this right here says, uh, India Today, Legend of Sabarimala, love story that kept women from Lord Ayapa, that kept women from him. You see that? Same story, same name. It says, while Lord Ayapa was still a minor, a lady demon, a lady demon, all right? Let's go back, Japa. So again, there was a woman, a lady demon, maybe, all right? We're talking about angels and gods. What are we talking about here? She says, I will myself descend to the earth to show how fragile is human virtue. She was talking about she was going to go seduce Japan. This, is this a lady demon too? All right, we go back. So it says, while well, Lord Ayapan was still a minor lady demon, had created havoc in the down south. Down south, all right. She had got a boom from God that she could only be defeated by the son born out of the union of Lord Shiva and Lord Vishnu. As it happened, Lord Ayapa defeated her in a battle. Upon her defeat, it was revealed that the demon was actually a beautiful young woman who had been cursed to live the life of a demon. The defeat set the woman free, who in turn proposed to Lord Ayapa. All right, so she wanted to marry him after this beautiful woman, right? Sounds like a temptation, right? <laughs> so he refused, saying that he had been ordained to go to the forest and answer the prayers of the devotees. All right, go separate himself. All right, let's go back to this encyclopedia real quick. All right, it says, it says a man named Japan wishing to win the favor of the gods left his family and wife and withdrew into the desert, withdrew to lead a life of chastity and contemplation, chastity, chastity. All right, just real quick, Merriam-Webster's 
all right dictionary is chastity what does it mean all right Absten abstention from unlawful sexual intercourse abstention from all sexual intercourse purity in conduct and intention restraint and simplicity in the sign or expression all right so celibate all right the same right as um you know ayapan so he refused that he had ordained all right so he said he don't want to marry her because he said no i want to be live a chastity life i want to go to the forest and answer prayers of the devotees but the young woman was persistent so lord ayapan promised to marry her the day kani swani's new devotees stopped visiting him with their prayers at, at sabari mala the woman agreed to wait for him at a neighboring temple the woman is also worshipped today as malik purata so again she's still waiting get it he's he's still celibate because they still going he still got worshippers that's that's what they're trying to tell you all right so wikipedia again this is a picture of i have found one of them but check it out he got the bow and arrows he got the bow and arrow Japan. look at the peacock we have peacocks here. and you know the spanish were calling the jaguars tigres or tigers they call ti uh, jaguars tigers so we had our own kind of tiger whatever you know but you know dodge the hijack where's the real story where's the myth all right, so Ajapan, you know, they just removed this AY and you got Japan, right? Japan, all right, Japan, all right, Japan. Again, it says that he was, uh, uh, let's see, so the iconography of Ajapan depicts him as a handsome celibate, all right, celibate doing yoga as an epitome of dharma all right that's the hijack let me show you something real quick right here where it says names and iconography all right it says the name ayapan sometimes spelled ayapa or ayapan may be related to the similar sounding ancient term ariya the sanskrit term ariya pali ariya is found in ancient texts of hinduism and buddhism where it means the spiritually noble extraordinary precious ones all right the precious ones the nagas the extraordinary the nagas the architects the nagas the spiritually noble the nagas however the word ayapan listen to this however however the word ayapan is not found in south india versions of the medieval era puranas leading scholars to the hypothesis that ayapan may have roots elsewhere this word is not from there all right ayapan is from somewhere else all right it's not from there this word all right this word is not from there because it's from here all right it's a toltec toltec people japan was an asiatic mortal who wanted to win a favor of the gods he was a mortal he was a real person all right we go back to the india today and it says there is another uh version all right it says according to another version lord ayapa is a historical figure ayapa he was born in the royal family of patalam all right touch the hijack a small kingdom located in patanam tinta district of kerala sabarimala temples located in the same district all right he was a historical figure now all of a sudden he's not just a deity all right but we gotta touch the hijack all right with that piece of evidence alone, a good circumstantial case is made out for the transference to pre-Columbian America of Hindu modes of thought, Hindu myths and deities, and Hindu religious practices, colored somewhat by influences to which they had been subjected on the way between India and America, and after being localized in the New World. All right, so, so this author, you know, they're still going with the, you know, that people came over here so they he's going with the whole okay he's finding a lot of resemblances uh story ceremonies and things that the hindu people or the ancient nagas were doing in america so he's trying to say oh so they came here the hindu came here maybe and then they localized in the new world so that's his view on it but we know this is the true old world uh india was you know was called hindustan and we know that you know we're correlating you know how many different people or researchers are letting us know you know where science and all this civilization and architecture started agriculture right maize and how it spread to the world from here
right? He continues says it prepares us too for the finding of snake worshiping people in the new world, and likewise for finding as we do find ascetics who engage in penitential potential exercises and begged for food as alms with bowls in their hands like the Brahmanic and Buddhist religious medicants. It further prepares us for identifying the elephant-like figures on Maya sculptures, stones. All right, again, elephant-like figures. They saw the elephant. They had elephants. Just like the mound, the elephant mound, right, we saw. All right. Maya sculptures, I says, declared by some to be badly drawn birds. All right, so they're saying that's not an elephant, that's just a badly drawn bird. So, why would they do bad? Come on. And also to find that these elephants are represented with conventional ornamentation of symbolic character, identical with the ornamentation of the elephant figures on Cambodian sacred stones. All right, it's the same. All right, because the Nagas went over there. All right, so did we bring elephants over there? That's the hijack, all right? Because we know, if you saw my ancient uh, animal video, all right? And um, I think it's part nine in this series, I forgot already, but it's, uh, we break down, you know, the ancestors of the, of the elephants originated here. So the ancestor of all the elephants was from here. So we had elephants here, all different kinds of elephants, not just like the ones they show like mammoths with hair and all that. We had elephants that look like the ones in Indian Africa. Right, and all over the Americas, different types. Right, so yeah, you know, again, they'll say, oh yeah, they extinct in the last ice age, but they can't. You know, that's 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 just conjecture. That's you know, they found. You know, we already know they found people right buried with um, well, elephants, right, mammoths, and all that buried with um, markings that it was humans scratching the bones and everything and, and, and all that and spearheads and all that. So. They were with humans, all right? So that's why you're gonna find elephant-like figures on the Maya sculptures. And and since they are the Nagas, it's gonna resemble, it's gonna be actually identical with the ornamentation element figures on Cambodian sacred stones. Does so that Buddhist influence reached America? is clearly indicated by the Kitsa cult figures reproduced on plate at page 256, all right? So now he's saying Buddha is Kitsa cult, all right? Maybe, but he may be seeing it backwards, right? As is well known, the Buddhists blended with their complex faith, the myths and religious practices of the various people among whom they settled. All right, so again, he's saying they came here. All right, but we already know. Uh, watch. It says throughout this volume, it is shown that there are ample data which point to fusions of myths and beliefs in America, similar to old world fusions. All right, the American. Tlaloc lore links with the dragon lore, the Drakan lore of China and Japan, Japan, and with the Naga lore of India, the Nagas, all right? When we come to deal with the goddesses, and especially with the goddess of jade or jadeite, water and herbs, her herb is that of Isis. We again meet with complexes that have no history in the new world but are similar to those who his history can be traced in the old world, all right? This is the old world, bro, my brother. So you gotta, you know, you're seeing it in reverse, all right? Anthropologists who favor the view that pre-Columbian American religion and civilization were of independent origin have of necessity to explain why the myths and practices of the new world assumed at the very beginning those complex features which in the old world resulted from the fusions and movements of many peoples of different racial types after a lapse of time much greater than that covered by the new world civilization from start to finish all right so he's trying to explain it why do they have all these same mythology and same goddess and goddesses from the old world because this is the old world he's trying to figure it out he's like yo we got to figure this out He's saying they have failed, however, to explain why the American races should have been the last to emerge from a state of savagery and why once they emerged, their progress should have been so phenomenally rapid. You see, because they're like, oh, they came after us. They try to give uh, dates for the Maya and the Aztec, like in the A.D.s, almost in the Christian era. Right. They're trying to say, oh, it's nothing older than that. But we already know that we debunk that. We know Caral Supe, we know all these monuments are really old. All right. They're still finding temples right now in the jungle. You'll see. And uh, so he's saying, you know, all of a sudden they came out 
after them right but then we grew so rapidly and even better than them like we surpassed them so why if they were there so long look at what he's saying he's saying it is possible granted that america received this population early in pleistocene pleistocene times all right a contention yet to be proved that a people who had so long remained in a state of stagnation should have once the seeds of civilization were sown surpassed even the ancient egyptian and mesopotamian peoples in the rapidity of their progress all right he's letting you know right this researcher in this book is this is an old book all right and he's letting you know so these people came after right and so, and they're supposed to be like after the uh, egyptians and mesopotamians how how did they surpass them how did they even surpass the ancient egyptians and mesopotamian people so fast all right could they have achieved in a few generations what the earliest civilized peoples in the world achieved only after the lapse of a good many centuries you see that we what we achieved in a few generations <laughs> is even greater than what they could have done in many centuries the, their history don't add up is what we're letting you know their whole history is bull it don't add up it's a legacy they can't tell you how they established writing and science and all that it's mythology they can't there's no uh archaeological excavation for that you can find all that here and he's letting you know this author even though he's trying to say it's an old world people that came here he's letting you know so how did they advance so fast and 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 at a higher level than even theirs in so little time they had all this time to go develop their science and stuff and create great cities like we did, we did over here but they never did right When questions like these are asked, it becomes difficult to reject the view that the sudden growth of civilization in America resulted from the intrusions of minorities from centers of the old world culture. All right, so he's like, it has to be people from the old world. That's the only way he can explain it in his ra rational mind. He's like, it has to be, but this is the old world. Of course, yeah, you're right. Yeah, man, we've been here. It's always been here. When further, it is found that so many myths, deities, beliefs common to the old world are found in the new, in the new, so this is new, right? But we already know what that Louis Agassiz told us, right? That America was falsely denominated the new world, when in fact it is the old world, all right? The contention seems sound that the onus of proof for their faith must be laid on those who favor the theory of independent origin. All right, so that's the author, Donald A. McKenzie, letting you know. All right, you need to match that up. Old world culture right here. This is the old world. All right. All right, so we're on page uh, 86 of this book. And it says here, the Abbey Brazur de Bourbourg. That's a person who has advocated the view that civilization had origin in America, found it necessary to assume that the American continent at one time extended as a great peninsula from the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea to the Canary Islands or their immediate vicinity. All right, so imagine all the way from Mexico, the Gulf of Mexico, the whole Caribbean, and all the way to the Canary Islands over to the other side almost. Uh, near Africa and Europe, all right, the Canary Islands, all right, so that was all connected, he's saying, all right, so when Atlantis sank, did it all sink, or just a piece, you know, so this vast extension of land was submerged as a result of a great convulsion of nature, all right, that's what he's saying, Yucatan, Honduras, and Guatemala sank too, but afterwards, the land rose sufficiently high to restore these countries and the West Indian Islands, all right? The Abbey, who was an accomplished American philologist, professed to have found records of this cataclysm in ancient American writings, of which he gave a hypothetical interpretation. His philological argument in support of the view that his Atlantis had real existence runs as follows, all right? So listen to what he's saying. Does the words Atlas, and Atlantic have no satisfactory etymology in any language known to Europe, all right? That doesn't exist over there. They are not Greek. 
and cannot be referred to any known language of the old world or of their languages, right? But in Nahuatl, I right, listen to this, the Nahuatl language, we find immediately the radical A or ATL, like Atlanta, right? A alt or alt, which signifies water. All right, ATL, remember Maya, Ma, the water also, and ATL as well in Nahuatl, the Mexica, Aztec, Uto Aztecan, they speak Nahuatl, right? ATL signifies water, war, and top of the head, top of the head. From this comes a series of words such as Atlan, on the border of, all right? Atlan, like Teoti, or like Tinotitlan, all right? amid water, all right? So the city of Enoch, amid the water, Tinochtitlan. What Enoch? All right, so Atlan on the border of or amid the water, from which we have the adjective Atlantic, all right? That's from here, not a Greek word. We have also Atlaka, to combat or be in agony. It means likewise to hurl or dart from water. And in the preterist makes Atlas, Atlas, a city name, Atlan. All right. To hurl or dart from water and makes Atlas, a city named Atlan, existed when the continent was discovered by Columbus. All right. There was a city and we've read this before, all right? There was an actual city called Atlan, I believe in Panama somewhere, existed when the continent was discovered by Columbus at the entrance of the Gulf of Uraba in Darien. Yup, that's in Panama. With a good harbor, it is now reduced to an unimportant pueblo named Acla. You see, they switched the name, but it was called Atlan. So you know how Greeks add the T-I-S to the end? So that would be Atlantis according to a Greek, right? Atlan, this town, this city would be known as that. So that's an ancient town, a navigational port. We know Panama's the Panama Canal, that's where all the ships go, right? Well, it was like that in ancient times. You can read that in um, Atlantis in America by I Ivan Sapp. All right, we got Brother Jaguar reading this to us in the Atlantis series he got. All right. So he continues, says, those who have pinned their faith to Plato's account of the lost Atlantis have overlooked two facts. It says here, one, that the events related to Solon by the Egyptian priests took place 9,000 Egyptian years earlier, and that navigation on it, the Atlantic Ocean, ceased on account of the quantity of mud which the engulfed island left in its place. All right. Now he's talking about when Plato's and all these Greeks are recounting the tale of Atlantis, they tell you that during those days, the Atlantis, uh, Atlantic was navigable, meaning they couldn't navigate the Atlantic during home, uh, Plato's time. Those ancient Greeks couldn't navigate the Atlantic. There was too much mud, he wrote. That's what uh, Plato wrote, all right? Thank you.